just like we discussed um, some disorders that affect the female reproductive system, when we are talking in general reproductive system, we need to um, look also at um, conditions that may affect the um, male reproductive health. And there, there is a variety of conditions that um, can um, uh, produce all kind of disorders of um, the reproduction in males. Um, and those disorders will be covered in uh, chapter 55. The first one, and again, we are starting with the most benign condition, um, is called cryptorchidism. And crypto means uh, hidden uh, or unevident. So cryptorchidism is that condition in which one or both testes um, are not present in the scrotum. Uh, it's a failure of the testes to be present in the scrotum. And undescended testes, um, that can be on one side or on both sides. Uh, they can be, as you can see in this picture, anywhere in the inguinal canal. Um, they may show up in the abdominal cavity and sometimes very, very rare. Uh, they can be found um, very close to the perineum or in a femoral canal. Uh, so when I say in the femoral canal, instead of finding them here over the, um, the inguinal canal, we find them kind of at the level of the uh, root of the thigh. Whenever we um, see a patient with cryptorchidism, the scrotum uh, at examination will be empty. Um, otherwise, the client is totally asymptomatic. There are no pain or any kind of complaints um, on the side of the patient. Most of the times, this condition is um, diagnosed in childhood or at puberty. Um, and understand the test is occasionally um, may found their way into the scrotum without the treatment, but most cases, they do need um, a treatment and um, the treatment needs to be as soon as possible. So um, now to talk about the fertility of a patient, um, there is the need of at least one testis to be um, situated in the scrotum to make sure that there will be a production of normal sperm um, and um, allow for a normal um, uh, fertility in that patient. And we see many patients that um, may have only one testis, not necessarily due to cryptorchidism, but because um, a testis, in, the other one was removed because of malignant or benignant, most of the time will be injuries. So what is the cause for uh, understanding testis? Well, we don't really have um, a known uh, pathophysiology. However, what do we know is that a testis remains undescending during childhood there is a very high uh, risk for affecting the fertility. So if the testis is not brought as soon as possible to the, uh, to the scrotum outside of the abdominal cavity, will be exposed to higher temperature than usual. Normal production of sperm uh, needs lower temperature. Um, if you remember when we discussed um, in term one in fundamentals, we were talking about um, temperature and measuring temperature and how we like to measure and find a method that will allow us to get as close as possible to the core temperature. And uh, you remember that the core temperature is a little bit different than the temperature of the body on the outside, um, on the um, envelope of the body at the level of the skin. So this time, they cannot have a normal uh, function if they are exposed at high temperature inside the body. So usually we do um, like to um, fix that before two years of age, and most of the cases are diagnosed as uh, babies or even at, at birth. Um, if not, uh, seminiferous tubules will uh, atrophy and fibros, uh, fibros will um, show up. So in some cases, uh, what we do um, in infants that are after six months of age, they will receive HCG, um, and they will receive HCG, the uh, chorionic gonadotropin hormone, uh, twice weekly for four weeks. Um, in a try to stimulate the testis uh, to release testosterone, and by doing that, will kind of push the testis down into the scrotum. Um, if for this medical trial, uh, there is no response, and, and actually the, the response rate is very high, it's up to 80%. Um, surgery is um, how we um, secure the testis down in the scrotum. And the procedure is called an orchiopexy. Um, if you see the suffix pexy, it means a surgical fixation of an organ. Um, we cannot just release the uh, 
testicle down in the scrotum, we need to make sure that it will be fixed over there and it will not going to become a floating testicle, one that goes in and out. Because if you remember, they're starting to develop just like the ovaries. In an embryonic stage, they develop inside the abdominal cavity and they travel uh, throughout the inguinal canal to the uh, scrotum. And they're supposed to be in the scrotum at the moment of birth. If they are not, they need to be brought over there and fixed uh, to the base of the scrotum uh, with uh, a few stitches to make sure that they are not going uh, up and down. Um, in terms of nursing management, the most important thing is the um, the education, uh, the education of the pa of the parents uh, for babies and young children regarding the um, complications, um, eventual complications uh, from not treating the condition um, and the. It's not only that they may become uh, non-fertile, but at a certain point, by allowing the testicle to continue to be in the abdominal cavity, they may develop testicular cancer. Um, if it happens later in life, and it, there may be those cases where a male was not able to have any kind of medical um, um, support until an, a, a quite uh, older age, um, we need to um, teach those patients once the surgery is performed how to perform self examination, the testicular examination that needs to be uh, monthly uh, because they are at a high risk to develop uh, testicular cancer. Also, the moment that they feel that there is any kind of lesion or any kind of change in the structure of the, um, of the testicle, they need to um, look for um, medical help. So first question will be, is the following statement true or false? Uh, Hypothetism is evidenced by painful swelling of the scrotum. So that statement is false, and that's because crypotidism is totally asymptomatic. The only evidence of crypotidism is an empty scrotum. And um, sometimes we may be able to palpate um, testicles in the inguinal canal. Um, otherwise, they will be in the abdominal cavity and will be evident only uh, if we are using ultrasound or um, during surgery. The next condition that we discuss will be what is called the torsion of the spermatic cord. Uh, and the torsion means the twisting. Uh, for this um, condition that we are describing here, that torsion will be a rotation of the twist of the testicle. Um, and just look at this image a little bit. This is the normal spermatic cord, how it looks like. Um, the moment that the testicle starts to twist um, uh, and rotate um, around an axis that goes um, um, caudal um, to um, the lower part of the body, you can see how the uh, the cord becomes twisted around itself. And by twisting it, we are putting pressure and we are compromising the flow inside the testicular artery. And by compromising the flow, the testicle is at high risk um, to um, go through necrosis. This is a condition that uh, usually is specific for prepubescent boys. Um, and sometimes in those men that their spermatic cord uh, congenitally uh, doesn't have a big support of uh, tunica vaginalis, that membrane that surrounds the testicles. It's like a, a modification in their, their structure. So what your uh, patient will present with, uh, usually it's a sudden and extremely sharp testicular pain. And immediately it's followed by a visible local swelling. Something else that happens usually because of the tor torsion, one of the testicles, the one that is affected, becomes shortened. Shortened. It, it looks closer to the body as opposed to the other one when we are examining the patient. Uh, sometimes the pain is so severe that they have all the signs of uh, peritoneal uh, irritation involvement as nausea and vomiting and chills and fever. And um, sometimes uh, we can connect that with some type of um, intense exercise. Um, however, it may happen just because even in, in without a lot of physical activity. So when we examine the, the patients, what we see is um, an extremely tender testis. I was telling you that you see an elevation of the, of the scrotum. And if you're um, elevating it a little bit more, that will intensify um, the pain by increasing the degree of the twist. Um, the treatment is uh, one and one only. It's a... Um, full-blown emergency, it needs immediate surgery in order to prevent the necrosis of the um, testicle and to um, ensure that uh, we preserve the fertility. 
in, during the procedure, what we do, we reduce the torsion. It means that we un, untwisted it, totally untwisted it. Um, we remove any type of tissues that may um, uh, prevent a good fixation of the testicle in the scrotum, and we anchor the testicle at this level over here at the basis of the um, at the scrotum with a few sutures. Um, in, it, it's a good idea for most of those patients to have a prophylactic procedure performed on the opposite side, because if it happens on one side, um, probably they have the same typical congenital, um, you know, development. So it's a good idea to, to do a fixation on both, both sides because they may develop it uh, again on the other side. Um, in terms of nursing management, most of those uh, will be um, after the surgery. Um, when we need to teach the patient how to apply uh, a scrotal suspensory uh, or a jock strap. And they need that, especially the moment that they are out of bed. By supporting the testicles, we are reducing um, the swelling and um, the pain. And we'll also uh, need to make sure that the dressings are um, free of any kinds of um, bleeding or infection. Um, may or may not be prescribed antibiotics depending on the decision uh, from the primary care physician, from the surgeon, and um, they need to um, report um, any uh, sudden onset of pain uh, back to the physician. The next condition we call what those are um, conditions that affect the, um, the tip of the penis. And uh, we have two situations. One is called uh, phimosis and one is called paraphimosis. And those conditions um, are very common in uncircumcised male patients when the opening of the foreskin uh, may become uh, constricted. And there are two situations that it become constricted. And you can see that the foreskin that is still present in those uh, uncircumcised male uh, can become constricted um, over um, the head of the of the penis, the tip of the, the penis, and will prevent the retraction of the foreskin. And the paraphimosis is the same contraction of the foreskin. However, it's a strangulation of the glands uh, when the foreskin was uh, retracted and we cannot push it back over the, um, the glands of the penis. Um, usually those conditions are caused by um, congenital small foreskin, that it happens in some of the patients. Um, but in most cases, the main cause for it will be the chronic inflammation of the glands penis. Um, and in between the layers of the, uh, the penis and the foreskin will be some degrees of inflammation that are healing with adhesions that will keep those two structures kind of uh, together connected. Um, what happens in terms of signs and symptoms? The patients will present with uh, pain with erection and intercourse and having difficult time to clean under the foreskin because they cannot, uh, and especially in the phimosis. Um, those with paraphimosis will experience a painful swelling of the glands and you can see how it's completely strangulated in this picture. You can see it blue. It's totally, the blood flow is totally compromised over there. If this condition continues, both of them, but especially the paraphimosis is a bigger uh, emergency, um, you, we end up to show severe edema, urinary retention, and the surgical procedure is the typical circumcision procedure that will remove the foreskin um, and is the only one that can fix the condition. Another type of condition that affects the um, external um, sexual organs um, of the males um, are kind of summarized in one, they are interconnected um, and are uh, ending with the suffix silly. And suffix silly means swelling, not as a result of inflammation or infection, just the swelling, an increase in the size of an organ. So hydrocele, hermatocele, and varicocele, they all present uh, when the patient comes for examination as a swelling of the scrotum. Um, in each of those will be a different, um, a, a different cause for them. Um, most common, hydrocele and spermatocele, they do not have a lot of clinical significance. They are not very important and patients usually are diagnosed because they are coming for a different condition and 
the scrotum is examined also, and most of the time they do not require treatment. On the other hand, this one, the uh, varicocele, um, it, it is considered in some of the patients a cause for male infertility and um, is recommended to be repaired as quick as possible. And the reason why varicocele, varicocele seed, if you look at it, you see it looks like the uh, varicose veins that are big and inflamed um, at the level of the testis. And as any other varicose veins that are inflamed, um, they are bringing with them a lot of blood. By increasing the blood flow, we are increasing the temperature by the testicle. And if you remember what I said when we discussed the um, cryptorchidism, sorry for that, cryptorchidism, the testicles, they need a low temperature to function normally and develop normal um, uh, spermatozoa. So it needs to be fixed in order for the um, testicle to function normally. So let's look um, very quick on how do we do um, um, a good testicular examination. So what the patient needs, we need to teach the patient to use both hands to palpate the testicles. And we need to tell them how and describe to them what do they need to feel. They need to feel the normal testicle is smooth and uh, uniform in consistency. You cannot have lumps and bumps and different areas that have different consistency. So they need to grasp with the index and middle finger under the testis and the thumb will be on top and they need to roll the testis gently horizontal between the thumb and the fingers. And they need to feel for any evidence of lumps, abnormalities, pain. Um, and when they do this, they need to do it on, on both sides. And once the testicle was felt, they need to locate and palpate the epididymis. And that looks, and no, it doesn't look, it feels like um, a cord-like structure. And um, it's positioned on the top and in the back of the testicle. And this is that part, if you remember from anatomy, is the part that stores and transports the sperms, where the sperms are maturing themselves before being eliminated. And after that, if they fill that structure, they need to move and palpate the spermatic cord. And we are, they need to repeat that on both sides. Um, it is better to be uh, done while being in a shower um, and um, because it's, um, it's easier um, to feel uh, the structures and the testicles are not contracted, especially if it's done in an environment that is cold. It will be hard sometimes to properly examine the, the cord and the epididymis because of the contraction um, of the scrotum. So let's move into our infectious um, and or inflammatory conditions. And the first one that we'll discuss is called prostatitis. Itis um, is an inflammation, may or may not be infectious still, but it's an inflammation. And it's the inflammation of the prostate gland. Um, most, most, most of the cases will be infectious caused by microorganisms that will breach the prostate uh, through the urethra. Um, and the most common one is the uh, E. coli. And those will be um, your infections that are sexually transmitted. Um, in some instances, however, we may not be able to evidence any kind of bacteria involvement. Um, regardless why and, and what is the causative agent, if we can find or not a, a, a microorganism that is causing it, um, the inflammation will result in a gland swelling and the tenderness of the prostate. And now because the prostate, and you can see it here in a section, uh, because the prostate is surrounding the urethra, the moment that um, um, it swells, it will produce a certain degree of urinary obstruction. So the patients will present with perineal pain uh, or at least discomfort or heavyness in the perineum area. Um, and an, an unusual uh, sensation that may precede or follow ejaculation. Um, others may come and complain of low back pain, uh, fever, chills, uh, dysuria, urethral discharge, kind of similar symptoms with um, STDs. Um, the treatment will be um, an antibiotic therapy that sometimes can be very long for prostate. We, we may get to up to 30 days of antibiotic therapy. Um, the pain uh, we can uh, ease the pain by using mild um, analgesics and uh, sitz bath. 
Um, now, in terms of nursing management, we need to uh, address the sexual partner and we need to um, address that by explaining the need to treat both of the partners, otherwise the reinfection may occur. Um, also, we may advise our patients to avoid caffeine, uh, prolonged sitting, constipation, um, and those because they can be irritants um, of the prostate. Another thing that may be needed in some patients is to um, teach them how to drain by massaging um, periodically the, um, the prostate. And that um, can be done by massage or by um, eliminating the, um, all the, the fluids that accumulates in the prostate through masturbation or uh, intercourse. We also need to emphasize the importance of complying with the antibiotic therapy that can be long. And uh, sometimes our patients may kind of shy off in the middle of the treatment only because they will feel uh, better. So is the following statement true or false? Prostatitis has several causes. And the answer is two. Um, the rationale is the fact that most of the cases um, are infectious. There is a wide range of microorganisms that can cause the prostatitis. However, other causes are psychosocial, sexual problems, and sometimes um, a cause that we cannot identify um, may produce a prostatitis in some patients. Other infectious and inflammatory conditions are epididymitis and orchitis. So those two inflammations, one is the um, epididymis inflammation, epididymitis, and the other one is the testis. Uh, inflammation, the orchitis, they can come together uh, or they can come what is called concurrently. Um, one can start and after that the other one shows at the same time or subsequent. And usually as a cause we have an extension of an infection agent that started as an STD or as a prostatitis um, and uh, now it becomes epididymitis and orchitis. We may have what is called non-infectious epididymitis as a result of long-term indwelling catheters um, or as a result of prostatectomy um, as a iatrogenic type of um, inflammation. Um, another characteristic type of orchitis that shows up without the involvement of the epididymis uh, is characteristic for mumps uh, involvement of um, the testicles. And if you remember, mumps uh, is that type of germ. Um, it's that virus that has a preference for glands and um, testicles have a structure similar to a gland. Usually it occurs uh, after puberty. Um, and as a result of that, the patient may suffer of infertility because of testicular um, atrophy. Um, when we have patients with uh, bilateral epididymitis, may happen in some patients, um, and especially if it's recurrent, um, that may lead to what is called azospermia, or the absence of sperm, um, and that is because the production, the glandular, the semiferous tubes are, are um, completely destroyed and they are not able to uh, produce any more testicle, um, I'm sorry, any more spermatozoa. So, in those patients, what will be the main complaint, the signs and symptoms? Um, they will complain mainly of pain and there will be a certain degree of swelling that may be just at the level of the scrotum or the whole thing, including the inguinal area. Um, they may show up with fever and chills, especially if it's a bacterial one. Um, they may have pus uh, identified in their urine. We may culture bacteria out of the urine. Um, and when we examine them, um, usually the scrotal skin uh, is red and tense. Um, one critical point here is to differentiate epididymitis, the inflammation slash infection, from testicular torsion. Because in torsion, surgical um, treatment is an emergency, while for epididymitis, the treatment is pure medical with bed rest, scrotal elevation, analgesics, um, anti inflammatory agents, and um, antibiotics. Now, scrotal elevation um, is usually um, re um, realized by using those kind of um, um, testicle suspensors.
And mainly when we are doing that, we are um, relieving the pain by um, lessening the weight of the testicle. Um, also, um, in terms of home care, uh, we can offer instructions on how to uh, take the antibiotics and how to complete the treatment. Um, part of the pain and the inflammation can be released by uh, taking steep fits bath um, and by applying local heat, heat but only uh, it's very important to remember that the local heat, we do not apply it when the uh, scrotum is still um, big and uh, swollen. We need to wait for the scrotal swelling to subside. Erectile dysfunction um, is also known as um, impotence. And it represents the inability to, has more than one aspect. One aspect may be the fact that the patients may have the inability to achieve an erection. Um, on other cases, um, there is the inability to achieve an erection that is um, rigid enough to maintain a sexual activity. And in other cases, it can be the inability to sustain erection for a satisfactory period of time. Um, and usually uh, the patients are complaining of multiple or persistent um, incidences of failed directions. Um, if the patient comes after one or two times, that's, that's not enough uh, for a diagnosis to be made. Now, what will be the causes for erectile dysfunctions? Those may be um, physical and psychological. And um, the, now if we're looking just into the process of erection, and this depends on three basic processes. One will be the appropriate neurologic stimulation. Also, the patient has to have the adequate arterial blood flow into the blood vessels. Um, the, and when I'm talking about blood vessels, I'm talking about the cavernous artery, uh, which produces the expansion of the penile tissue. And the last part of it is the temporary trapping of the venous blood to sustain the erection. Now, if any of those steps are compromised or ineffective, as a result of that, the patient will have what is called an ineffective or insufficient um, erectile disorder. Um, as I said before, the common causes will be some type of neurologic disorders. And in those, uh, we include those with clear defined aspects, um, neurologic aspects as spinal cord injury, uh, perennial trauma, uh, testosterone insufficiency, some side effects of drug therapy. Um, very interesting is the that atherosclerosis and hypertension, along with complication of diabetes, will lead to erectile dysfunction. And very, very interesting is that a lot of your hypertension patients or patients with extensive atherosclerosis is the first sign of that, even before they experience a hypertension or even ex before experiencing a heart attack, will experience a certain degree of erectile dysfunction, but they will not gonna seek help um, for, um, for it because um, it's such a taboo to talk about it. Um, so we may sometimes diagnose hypertension or atherosclerosis at the very early stage if patients would have, or people would have pay attention to, um, to their bodies. So erectile dysfunction may be also related to anxiety or depression. Um, and one thing that I want to make very clear, impotence or erectile dysfunction is not a normal part of aging. Um, a lot more than half of all men at 75 or older will do have a certain degree of impotence, but that is related to factors that we can identify. So um, when we're assessing those patients, what do we need to take in consideration? Um, we need to talk with them about their sexual health history uh, and to understand what is the difficulty. Is the difficulty in achieving or is the difficulty in maintaining the erection? If the erection occurs, the client may reveal that there is insufficient rigidity so in terms of diagnostic findings, on a normal, uh, in a normal patient, men typically may have three to five erections while sleeping. And that, that, one, that thing is called a nocturnal penal tumescence and rigidity test that uh, we can take to determine uh, if the client um, 
is experiencing any spontaneous eruptions during sleep. Um, and by doing that, we may prove that physiologically, that patient has no issues. Um, and that will make the difference to understand that some of those patients actually have an anxiety or a psychosocial component in their erectile dysfunction. Uh, what can be done for those type of patients? We have both medical and surgical uh, treatments. Uh, we can um, substitute those drugs that may lead to um, different types of erectile dysfunction um, as a side effect and um, use other um, treatments instead of those. Uh, we can use the what is called the PDE5 inhibitors, and you probably already heard about that. Uh, sildenafil, which is Viagra, Tadalafil, which is Cialis, uh, probably heard about them and you've seen the ads on TV all the time. Those drugs will facilitate the, the uh, penal erection by producing a smooth muscle relaxation in the corpora cavernosa, allowing for the inflow of blood. It's a vasodilator, in other words. Um, keep in mind that because they are vasodilators, um, they do not know how to choose where to go. So they do not choose just the um, um, veins in the penis. They can produce vasodilation everywhere. So they do have side effects. Um, and if the patient has also uh, a heart condition and they are already taking a hypotensive medication, uh, by associating one of those drugs can cause an um, unsafe drop in their blood pressure. So they need to be aware of that. And um, whoever is prescribing the medication needs to um, advise the, the patient um, about this. Um, apomorphin, it's a dopamine agonist. Um, it's usually used for Parkinson's disease um, and can be used in those patients that the, the PDE5 cannot, cannot be used. And it's administered as a nasal spray. Um, and it has a few advantages over the Cialis and Viagra. Um, it actually acts within uh, 15 minutes after being administered, and it's safe for people that have coronary artery disease. Um, in some cases, we have what is called vascular surgery, can be an option for some um, clients, while most, most of the surgical um, procedures are actually for uh, implanting uh, pinout processes. Um, and, and there are tons of those. Uh, some will have a reservoir with a pump, um, and some will be just a, a simple rod. Um, there are all kinds of options that um, are discussed with the uh, patient before the procedure, and they decide what works best for them. Nursing management depends on the type of uh, treatment that we offer um, to the patient, and we kind of discussed them when I was discussing with you the um, different types of treatment. Um, this slide is actually um, summarizing the elements that I discussed before with you guys in terms of diagnostic findings, medical and surgical management, and the nursing management. So um, along with other um, direction disorders, we have the opposite of the um, um, erectile dysfunction. Well, we have a condition that is called priapism. Um, and in this condition, the penis becomes engorged and stays erect without any sexual stimulation for long periods of time. And usually the underlying etiology is a vascular problem. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, usually the blood that is thickened or a side effect of some medications, um, mainly medications prescribed to treat erectile dysfunction. Because it's engorged, the penis will produce um, quite a bit of discomfort and will interfere with the arterial blood flow. Um, and in some cases, even with urinary elimination. Um, whenever this type of erection uh, lasts longer than six hours, um, there may be a risk for um, tissue damage that can later may result in, um, in impotence. In terms of treatments, what we can um, administer is a vasoconstrictive medication as uh, terbutaline uh, or phenylephrine, the neosinephrine. So if, we, if we're erectile dysfunction, uh, we were prescribing vasodilators to increase the blood flow 
in uh, the preeclampsial case, we are administering vasoconstrictive medication uh, to allow the blood to flow out of the uh, penis. Um, there will um, that there are some surgical procedures that we can do, and you can see here the um, in the picture uh, depicted one of them when we are draining the trapped blood by uh, placing needle uh, in the side of the penis. Now we're moving into other condition of the um, prostate and um, we'll discuss now about benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, so let's define first of all what hyperplasia means. Hyperplasia means that a number of cells um, in any organ, it can happen anywhere, not only in the prostate, uh, will start to increase in number. They are non-malignant, they look just the same as the original cells. However, they increase in number. They become more and more and more, and the organ becomes bigger. Um, as a result of that, um, the prostate, as you can see it in this picture, becomes larger and starts to put pressure both on the urethra along the uh, Tra the tra trajectory that the urethra, urethra sorry, goes through um, um, the uh, prostate, and also it puts pressure at the level of the bladder neck, kind of bladder neck, kind of uh, strangling it. So, in terms of pathophysiology, um, it can occur um, at not necessarily at any age, but it starts with aging. Um, we don't have a really good cutoff of the age because we've seen that in, in kind of early cases in men in their 40s, or you may see it later in the 60s or 70s, every single one will be a little bit different. It is related with aging though. Um, and the fact that the prostate grows in, uh, outward, it doesn't make a big difference because there are not many organs on the outside, on the perineum and um, and around the prostate. The problem is the enlargement that goes inward, and I was showing you on the picture that goes towards the urethra and the bladder neck um, that will prevent a, a good e emptying of the bladder. So the symptoms usually are gradual. It, they do not happen overnight. Um, the patient usually will come and, and will complain of, of, of um, an increased effort to void, um, and that Increased effort corresponds with the increased narrowing of the urinary um, tract. And as a result of an increased um, narrowing of urinary tract, the stream of urine that comes out is narrow and has a very weak force. Um, and if you can see in this picture, you see the normal one and you see the one that is affected, uh, the bladder is kind of bigger and the wall looks less healthier looks a little bit distended. So the fact that we are emptying the, the man is emptying the bladder inefficiently and they are not completely emptying the bladder uh, will allow for the bladder to slowly increase in size and dilate and also becomes a very good culture medium for bacteria. And they will have recurrent uh, UTIs, uh, recurrent uh, cystitis, inflammation of the bladder um, situation. So how do we, we diagnose it? Um, DRE on your slide stands for uh, digital rectal examination. And this is the actual palpation of the prostate gland through the rectum. And usually what the doctor will feel is an enlarged and elastic gland. When we are doing uh, a cystoscopy, that's another way of examining it, uh, we see how the urethra becomes narrowed um, and how the bladder is affected. Uh, we can do um, other exams as um, uh, IVPs, uh, intravenous uh, pelographies, um, direct or retrograde, and we can do blood chemistry tests that um, allow us to get more information if there is any repercussions of the condition on the upper urinary tract from urinary retention. Uh, another thing that we can do is to measure the uh, residual urine, um, and that can be done by um, asking the patient to um, void and immediately after that performing an ultrasound and demonstrating by ultrasound that there is still urine 
uh, and we can even me measure the quantity of the urine uh, through ultrasound uh, in the blood. Another test that we can do, and it's uh, very typical for prostate, is what is called a prostate-specific antigen that usually is slightly elevated, um, has a bigger importance, PSA has a bigger importance in prostate cancer, um, but even in um, hyperplasia can be slightly elevated. Um, I said that we can do a, a transabdominal ultrasound. We have another one that we can do to demonstrate the uh, size and measure the size of the prostate. It's called a transrectal ultrasound that not only gives the size, but also the position and um, may identify or raise the suspicion of some malignancy uh, in this enlargement. So what we can do to um, treat um, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. So we have medical and surgical treatment depending on the stage of uh, prostate uh, hyperplasia. If, definitely for the early stages, uh, we just um, monitor those patients and they will need to have periodic digital rectal exams. Um, we can add in some cases drug therapy and one of them is called terazosin or hydrine. Um, and this is a type of alpha adrenergic blockers that what it's doing is relaxing the muscle in the prostate to relieve the urinary symptoms. It's not that much that hydrine will prevent the continuation of development of hyperplasia in the prostate, but will relieve the um, uh, side effects of, um, of the condition. Finasteride or Prospar or Propecia, um, they are also a type of androgen hormone inhibitor um, they are classified as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors um, and can be used to decrease symptoms. And in some cases, uh, they, um, it, some, some researchers say that they even um, will um, slower the process of enlargement in, um, in some cases. Um, we can even do a combination of, um, of those drugs with an alpha adrenergic blocker. Um, in some cases, um, some patients may take what is called salt palmetto. That's a, an herbal supplement um, that is, um, re is a result of a fruit of the palm tree. It's a herb extract from the bark. Um, and in some patients will relieve the symptoms because it interferes with the enzyme that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the active form of um, male hormone. Um, for those cases that are more advanced, um, we always have the option of performing a surgical procedure of removing um, the prostate. Um, that can be done um, as an open procedure. Classically, it was done as an open procedure by accessing the prostate through the uh, perineum. Um, and nowadays we are doing that as microinvasive, um, laparoscopic or robotic assisted. We have a, a few types of those. Um, we can do what is called um, transurethral resection of the prostate, but PERP, we can do um, a transurethral incision of the uh, prost prostate. Um, TULIP stands for transurethral laser incision of the prostate. So you can see that those are just um, acronyms for different um, procedures. They are, most of them, what they do, they will release and they will remove not the entire prostate, but they will um, remove the tissue that um, is hypertrophic around the urethra and um, um, has an impact on the uh, urinary flow. Now, uh, those procedures are not without any kind of side effects and up to 75% of the patients will have what is called retrograde ejaculation. Um, and in this type of uh, condition, what happens is that the semen, instead of being um, exposed outside, uh, will be deposited in the bladder um, at the time of the orgasm. Um, unfortunately, that renders your client sterile. So this is one of the side effects that we need to discuss with the patients in advance of the procedure. Um, they may have, uh, after the procedure also, they may have a temporary and sometimes, unfortunately, permanent urinary incontinence, which is a, a, a bad news, um, depending on the procedure and the surgeon skills. Now, um, when we are doing the perineal 
um, surgical approach, uh, one of the side effects may be uh, a permanent erectile dysfunction that some patients may, um, may experience. Nursing management will um, be focused on the stage of, uh, of the patient condition. So for those that are not yet ready for surgery, um, the nurse will instruct them on how to optimal uh, empty the bladder um, as much as possible and how to uh, take the medication and what side effects they may expect from the medication. Uh, for the surgical patients, we make sure that they understand um, the side effects or the complication, eventual complications as a result of, of the procedure. Also, we may need to explain to the patient that they will have a catheter in place after the procedure that can um, take days until that uh, will be removed. And in some patients, that catheter will have continuous irrigation. Um, so that's also um, an element that needs to be explained to the patient that their mobility may be impaired uh, for a certain amount of time uh, perioperatively. Um, so in terms of how do um, we maintain um, an optimal bladder function, um, we may need to teach them what is called the Valsava maneuver, um, how to assist bladder emptying by leaning forward on toilet or bearing down uh, or pressing down on the bladder while sitting on the toilet, that's per day maneuver. Um, we may need to explain to them that they need to drink frequent small volumes uh, of fluids uh, so the bladder will not become extremely full at once, kind of gradually um, split the amount of fluids that they need to drink throughout the day. They may need to limit alcohol and caffeine because those are stimulants, are irritants of the urinary system, and they may increase the urgency to urinate. Um, they may limit the use of cough, cold, or allergy medication uh, because they interfere with urination. Um, they have those uh, alpha inhibitors that they can um, block um, the urinary bladder contraction. Prostate cancer. So uh, prostate cancer is probably uh, the second to skin cancer in frequency um, in uh, Western countries and definitely in the United States. And it ranks second to um, lung cancer for male death from cancer. Um, when we are looking across different races, it has a higher incidence in African American, um, and it has a higher incidence in those men that had uh, a first degree relative that was diagnosed with the disease at a young age. Um, to look at statistics, um, we have one in seven males that will be diagnosed at a certain point with prostate cancer. Uh, and one in 39 that will die from the disease. However, this cancer is a very slow growing one and has a high survival rate. Um, usually with the correct treatment and diagnosing time, the survival rate for those patients is um, nearly 100%. Um, and we, if we're looking even further than that, if we're looking into 10 year survival, that's 98%. That means that it's really not killing a lot of people if they're doing um, what they need to do. So in terms of pathophysiology of the prostate cancer, uh, we don't have a known cause for it. Um, there seems to be a relationship with an increased testosterone levels throughout the life of that uh, patient um, and the diets that are high in fat. Um, again, there is a high risk for those that have first degree relatives that have prostate cancer. And usually the prostate carcinomas, they will have they will show up in the cells on the periphery of the gland. Um, and by expanding and growing, usually the symptoms will be very, very similar to the BPH. Um, they will have that um, hesitancy in voiding, um, the urinary obstruction type of syndromes, um, and repeated um, UTIs. Whenever the treatment is delayed or um, not followed properly, those um, prostate cancer cells uh, they can uh, spread and metastasis uh, to usually to lymph nodes in the pelvic area and to the bones. And the favorite places for the bone will be uh, lumbar vertebrae, uh, pelvis, and hips. In terms of signs and sy symptoms, um, we do not have a lot of symptoms at the beginning. Um, and for many years, because it's a very slow growing type of tumor, 
um, they will show up signs only when the tumor is large enough to compromise the urinary flow. In some cases, what we may see is um, an increased frequency um, in urination or dysuria, like difficult or painful urination or hematuria, blood in the urine. Um, and sometimes some may come and complain of what is called hemospermia, blood in um, semen. In other cases, unfortunately, the first symptoms will be those of a metastasis. Um, that will be at the level of the bones that they come and complain of uh, back pain um, and um, a pain that usually um, gets down, um, down the leg um, as a result of uh, metastasis compressing um, nerves.
So question number three is, if the following statement is true or false, prosthetic screening should begin for all men at age 60 of years. The answer is false. And um, the rationale for that is that um, an annual prosthetic screening uh, should begin for men uh, with a 10-year life expectancy at age 50. Uh, age 60 is way too late um, if we are trying to um, diagnose and save. There may be a lot of cases that um, will be um, diagnosed too late if we are starting at age 60. For those that are um, African-American or that have a first degree relative with a history of a prostatic cancer at, an, at, an, at a young age, um, the screening needs to start even earlier in their uh, 40s, around 45 years of age.
Now, last in um, in the list of cancers, we have the cancer of the of the penis, uh, which is very very rare. Um, is very frequent, however, when it happens in the uncircumcised men, uh, with an unknown cause, but um, presume that the chronic irritation will um, generate a precancerous skin lesion that will undergo some kind of malignant um, changes. Uh, treatment is usually the tumor excision associated with chemotherapy, um, may um, provide also um, external uh, radiation therapy or a combination of those uh, three. In terms of um, the extent of the surgical procedure, we can go from limited resections to the full amputation of um, the penis. Usually the five-year survival rate for uh, cancer of the penis is um, around 65%. Um, last thing on um, this presentation today will be the elective sterilization or the vasectomy, which is a very minor surgical procedure that can be done in any um, physician's office or clinic. And uh, throughout this procedure, um, what we do, we um, ligate the vas uh, difference. And as a result of that, we have what is called a permanent sterilization because the sperm cannot be transported from the testicles uh, to the outside. Very, very rare is a, is a complication of this procedure. The, the client may complain of um, erectile dysfunction. Um, it's hard to understand. It's probably more related to anxiety and psychosocial um, issues than uh, to a direct effect of the procedure because the procedure is done um, at the level of the perineum um, under the scrotum. So uh, it, it, it's not related to any type of erectile, erectile mechanism. Now, for those patients, they need to sign a special um, type of consent. It's not just the consent for a surgical procedure, but also a consent that they understand all the repercussion of becoming sterile. Um, and um, we need to offer and um, ask them if they consider to have sperm in a sperm bank uh, if needed for the future. Um, in terms of um, nursing um, management or um, teaching, uh, we can explain to them that they will need to apply ice packs to the scrotum to reduce the swelling immediately after the procedure. Um, they may take mild uh, analgetics and to wear any type of um, testicular support to um, provide a little bit of comfort. Um, they can resume um, usual activities in two to three days and um, even exercise after five days. However, the sexual activity is uh, reserved to uh, when the comfort um, allows. It is a very reliable method of contraception. However, um, we need to advise the patients that um, they need to wait up to a month uh, after the procedure to make sure that they are not fertile because some of the sperm may still be uh, present in the ducts um, below the level of the um, uh, resection. They need to report back to, uh, to the medical uh, office for any kind of severe pain, fever, or uh, swelling. 